This conference will now be recorded. Somebody needs to, um, somebody speaker is Is that you, Mayor? I had it off. It just popped on all by itself. Yeah. Hey, darn ghost in the machine. Well, all right. You just need the X right there. Notice is hereby given that the Lago Vista City Council is holding a regular meeting on Thursday, September 2nd, 2021, beginning at 5.33 p.m. with executive session. As prescribed by VTCA, Government Code Section 551.041, to consider the following agenda items. Sandra, please note, excuse me, we have all of our council members here, except for... Councillor Marion at the time, hopefully she will join us in executive session. Mayor, I'm here. Oh, caller one, there she is. I stand corrected, Sandra, please note we have all of our council members here. All right, executive session. We will convene into a closed executive session pursuant to section 551.071, advice of council, 551.072, real property, 551.074 personnel, section 551.087 economic development, Texas government code and section 1.05 Texas disciplinary rules of professional conduct regarding A, consultation with legal counsel and possible action concerning any regular meeting agenda item requiring confidential attorney client advice necessitated by the deliberation or discussion of said item. Excuse me. B, update on pending litigation, Alisi Reed versus City of Lago Vista, Robert Mercado and Doyce Smith, civil action number 21-464, section 551.071, consultations with attorney, and section 1.05, Texas disciplinary rules of professional conduct. C, update on pending litigation, Brittany Henry versus City of Lago Vista, EEOC charge 451-2020-0181, section 551.071, consultation with attorney and section 1.05, Texas disciplinary rules of professional conduct. D, update on pending litigation, David Stewart, versus City of Lago Vista, cause number D-1-GN-20-0077-01 in the 459th Judicial District, Travis County, section 551.071, consultations with attorney, section 1.05, Texas disciplinary rules of professional conduct. E, consultation with city attorney regarding sale of property at 2805 Bonanza, Sections 551.071, consultations with attorney, and 551.072, deliberations about real property, and section 1.05, Texas disciplinary rules of professional conduct, and F, consultation with legal counsel and possible action concerning any regular meeting agenda item requiring confidential attorney client advice necessitated by the deliberation or discussion of said item as needed, uh, section 551.071, consultation with attorney, and section 1.05, Texas disciplinary rules of professional conduct. Under F, we will be uh, consulting with attorney uh, on regular agenda item number 10. And we will convene at 5.36 p.m. We'll be back. This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Let's see if I can pull this up. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Conference will now be recorded. 
Shalane, are you there? Yes, Mayor, I'm here. Right, call her seven. All right. I have to watch for that green dot. What is it? I can't get them up. I can't get them up. I can't get them up in the morning. You do that. Uh huh. All right. We're being recorded. So are y'all ready? All right. Let's go. All right, we reconvene from executive session into open session to act as deemed appropriate in city council's discretion. We reconvene at 6.33 p.m. Aaron, if you don't mind, would you uh, give a briefing to the citizens on um, A through E, what we discussed? Is my vote Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me now? Um, yes, sir. Uh, so for item A, uh, outside counsel uh, provided legal guidance to counsel uh, regarding uh, item number 10 on the agenda. Um, for item B, C, and D, I provided updates to uh, counsel regarding the pending litigation, regarding the status. Um, item E, I provided legal guidance to counsel regarding potential litigation risks uh, regarding item number seven. All right, thank you very much. And uh, number F, I was going to discuss number letter F because uh, Aaron was not in the executive session during F, but she did say something about it in A. Basically, for F, we met with the uh, outside counsel and uh, to discuss uh, agenda item number 10. We will now move into uh, our pledge, into our, let's see, make sure I got this in the right order here. All right, so now we move into our regular session. And we will start with our Pledge of Allegiance to the U.S. and the Texas flag. Start with the U.S. flag. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the Texas flag. On the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to be Texas, one state, under one and indivisible. All right. Thank you. Y'all may be seated. All right. Citizen comments. In accordance with the Open Meetings Act, Council is prohibited from acting or discussing other than factual responses to specific questions, any items not on the agenda. I did get one citizen participation form for citizen comments, and that is from Ms. Talitha Wheatley. Uh, Ms. Wheatley, uh, you are recognized. You have the floor at this time. Hi, can you hear me okay? Hello. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so my concern was of the you know, unfortunate mailboxes situation of lack of delivery of mail and how now apparently there's only 29 boxes that will be in this cluster box at Crystal Way and Omaha Drive cross section. Um, and I went around and counted today and there, it, there appears to be 93 homes in this area that do not get mail. So of those 29, we'll get, start getting some at some point and you know, to do the math, that still leaves a remaining of us with, 
sorry, uh, 64 homes that won't get mail delivery. And so we still have to go to the post office and deal with the super happy employees there um, and just wait in line. And they're very disgruntled, for lack of a better word, to come out and bring our mail. Um, and you did provide me for information with um, Veronica White, uh, phone number and fax number. So thank you for that. Um, I guess my concern is we just contact her and go from there, or is there anything else we can do? Is it just us dealing, you know, the, the citizens dealing with USPS directly, and then y'all are out of the mix of it for now? Or do you know, can you kind of guide us in what to do from here? All right. So it's, it's a really difficult question <laughs> to answer. Um, I won't discuss agenda item that we have on here. We'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, but just so you'll know, um, we have to, the city has to sign a release that allows the, the postal service to come in and actually put the mailboxes on to our property. We have to give them permission to do that. Um, they sent me a form for me to sign. However, that form said it had to be signed by the individual homeowners or it had to be signed by the owners association. Well, that doesn't apply to me as the mayor of the city. I don't represent the individual homeowners or the property owners association. So I sent it back and said, Hey, this needs to be amended so that it's something that I'm actually authorized to sign. Uh, so far, I have not gotten anything back as far as an amended agreement letter. Um, so I'm waiting on that. Uh, Ms. White is, I'm told, is on vacation until next week. Um, hopefully, I'll have some contact from her with her next week. Um, in the meantime, the letter that they she sent me was for two cluster box units, which would be two 16 unit boxes um, that are supposed to be for the original 29 homes that Braun Homes built in the area. There's no reference whatsoever about the remaining homes that have been built since then or any other builders or anything else. So I do not know what to do about the other 70, 70 something homes or 60 something homes. Um, hopefully when I talk to Veronica, I can find that information out, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know what we're gonna do for additional boxes. Um, I've, I've provi started providing uh, her contact to citizens that have called. Uh, maybe if y'all reach out to, to her, uh, her and her legal team, Maybe it'll light a fire and they'll get me something that I can sign and maybe we can come up with some solution for the remaining uh, 69 homes in the area or 64 homes in the area. Um, but that's where we're at right now. So um, yeah, um, I can't can't give you a great answer is it's that it's resolved, but we are still working on it and ho hopefully we'll know something this next week. Um, but Okay, well, thank you. I guess I'm just after tonight's you know, meeting. I, I got, after tonight's meeting, we should basically be at a at the point where all we got to do is sign the form. So, but that'll just be for the 29 boxes, not everybody, right? Right. Okay. Unless unless I can get them to amend that. Um, I think but, you have that power. So, yeah. Yeah, that's why that's why we've got this far in three years. <laughs> um, so basically, so we should just keep contacting you. This Veronica White, I'll share that information with my next door neighbors and such, and just try to just keep pushing them. I just I felt like we had so much momentum. We had this 120 box system that was going into place, and now it's like wall wall, you know, just 29 and um. Okay, well, we'll just, I'll just share this information. We can all keep contacting this lady and hopefully she'll do something. <laughs> but thank you very much for your and Tracy's responses on emails. I appreciate it very much. 
You bet. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That is the only citizen that I had signed up to speak and address council. Is there anyone out there who didn't get me a card that would like to address council? All right. We shall move on then. Items of community interest. Pursuant to Dex Texas Government Code Section 551.0415, the City Council may report on any of the following items. Expressions of thanks, gratitude, and condolences, information regarding holiday schedules, recognition of individuals, reminders regarding City Council events, reminders regarding community events, and health and safety announcements. Um, Monday is a holiday for Labor Day. Uh, so city offices will be closed on Monday. Uh, for September 11th. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Stand by. Hello. There we go. All right. For September 11th, uh, Tracy and I and Chief Norman are working on a special 20th anniversary recognition of September 11th. Uh, we have not worked out the details just yet, um, but stand by for a, a press release, news release, announcing what we're going to do for September 11th. Uh, and I think that is all I have. That's all William's hand go over. Uh, two things. Uh, one, Arch Dobla's today's his birthday. He's trying to hide it, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I'm not going to let him hide it. <laughs> okay. Don't ask me how old I am. You know? <laughs> uh, and condolences to both the uh, uh, Shalane, Marion, and uh, Trixie Avinka, they both had some some deaths in the family. So I want to just say my condolences to them. And prayers. And prayers. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Lions are having their barbecue fundraiser this weekend. We're going to be manning that smoker um, Friday night and to Saturday. I just wanted to thank the North Shore for stepping up and ordering and filling the entire smoker. Uh, and if you did put an order in, come on out Saturday night, six to eight, to pick up your barbecue. Thank you. Anyone else? Jeff, where, where do you pick up the barbecue? Councilor Marion, do you have any uh, school information? Thank you for asking, Mayor, but I uh, do not have any of those to share this evening. And thank you, Councilor Williams. You got it. Mo. Should we say congratulations to the um, football team for winning in third overtime against Cameron Yo, 64 to 62? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a good day. Yeah, hey. congratulations. Was that an official game or practice? No, it was, no, that was yeah. official. First game of the season, I believe. Wow. Yeah. And it was that Cameron Yo. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. a lot of scoring, too. It was, well, third, triple overtime. Oh. Yeah. All right. Is there any citizen out there that has an item of community interest they would like to share? All right, we shall move on. Consent agenda. All matters listed under consent agenda are to be considered routine by the city council and will be enacted by one motion. There will not be separate discussion on these items. If discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. We have number three, the approval of the July 22nd, 2021 and July 29th, 2021 special call meeting minutes. And number four, acceptance of the easement from Braun Homes and authorize the mayor to sign the documents. And that's in regards to the postal boxes. And I'll entertain a motion. <laughs> Mayor, I will make a motion that we accept the consent agenda as modified by Ms. Barton during the week. 
from us as the mayor's so over in one of the meeting minutes. Second. second. All right. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. We got an echo. Aye. 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 Speaker on. All those opposed? Aye. Hearing none, consent agenda is approved unanimous. All right. Number five, discussion item. Discussion of golf carts on streets and a possible creation of a city ordinance to address unlawful operation of golf carts within the Lago Vista city limits by unlicensed persons. And this is being brought to us by Councillor Davila. And so I'll let you read the executive summary and uh, proceed from there. The executive summary reads, as the operation of golf carts on city streets has increased over the last each few years, the increase has become a hazard to persons and property of the residents of Lago Vista, namely the operation by unlicensed and at times underage children. This is a growing concern for both the residents and the governments in many cities in Texas, including Lago Vista. Cities have resorted to requiring licensing or at a minimum, the registration of these vehicles. These quasi restrictions on street operations have resulted in cities controlling the hours of operation, as well as the areas in which these motorized vehicles may be used. One such city is Galveston, Texas, where golf cart rentals abound. The, the proposition to be discussed and possibly acted upon is to require minimum safety standards of golf carts uh, that, to have headlights, turn signals, and horns, but more importantly, requiring the registration and possible insurance coverage on golf carts. There are several cities with model ordinances that may be studied before enacting and enforcing our own set of requirements. One such city is Jamaica Beach, Texas. In a short 2019 discussion with Police Chief Smith, that city's ordinance and street signage was introduced and an agreement made to follow up with further review by our city manager. However, that discussion failed to materialize and no further review was made. Today's more frequent use of golf carts in Lago Vista requires the city's attention and possible action. And Mayor, <clears throat> I respectfully uh, ask that we um, table that discussion because I have not yet had the discussion with Chief uh, Smith to discuss how to best handle uh, the registration of golf carts. All right. Hey, Mike. Yes, sir. Mr. All right. May you might want to watch when you had that discussion, pull the city manager and Aaron in together so you can have a round robin on that. Thank you. That's a good, good suggestion. All right. I don't have any citizens that have signed up to speak on this agenda item. And I have a motion from uh, Mr. Davila to table this. Uh, do I have a second? A second. All right. I got a second from Councillor Prince. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? Hearing none, the motion is tabled unanimous. And we go to agenda item. We go into our public hearing and possible action first consideration. Uh, number six, the Lago Vista City Council is holding a public hearing considering ordinance of the City Council of Lago Vista, Texas, amending the official zoning map regarding the current plan development district, PDD, known as Firefly Cove and previously described as Pusikani Cove in ordinance number 07-10-04-04 to approve an amended concept plan for the entire development consisting of approximately 281.45 acres and to approve a detailed plan for everything except the area designated as the location of approximately 45 estate lots and providing for related matters. Uh, following this cover sheet and summary is the attached staff land use report specifically prepared for the city council for considering this application. 
It precedes the packet and included a very similar staff land use report that was presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission for use in formulating their recommendation at their August 12, 2021 meeting. That recommendation followed a clarification by the staff confirmed by the applicant that there was never an intent to seek to seek detailed plan approval for the estate lots. Instead, they were seeking a concept plan approval for the entire development, knowing that a future detailed plan approval would be required prior to the development of the anticipated 45 estate lots. They also explained that the reference in their narrative about street design that led to the confusion in the Planning and Zoning Commission version of the stand staff land use report was a simple typographic error. As the council can well imagine, the development services director welcomes any occasion when he is not the source of a confusing typing error. <laughs> the Planning and Zoning Commission, with six of the seven members in attendance, unanimously recommended approval of the zoning district change contingent upon a number of conditions that clarify the need to seek detailed plan approval for the estate lots in a future application. There was also a condition related to the fact that there are still a small number of very minor outstanding comments from the city engineer and a third party consultant engaged to assist with the review of the required traffic impact analysis. These outstanding comments are not out of a substantive nature and all of the improvements required by the TEIA are clearly identified to the satisfaction of the city engineer. And if approved, the development can proceed to seek approval for the various required plats and construction plans for all phases, with the exception of the estate lots, which will require a future application seeking detailed plan approval for those estimated 45 additional lots. If denied, the desired new development will be limited to phase 1A approved by the Lago Vista City Council in ordinance number 20-11-19-01. However, the balance of the property will remain approved for the development consistent with ordinance number 07-10-04-04, which includes entitlements for both commercial and multifamily components, as well as a large number of single family residents and I will open the public hearing at 6.54 p.m. And Roy or staff, do you have anything to add to this summary? Um, I'll welcome somebody else making the five minutes. <laughs> All right, we have Firefly in the audience. Is there anything that you would like to say to council on behalf of the application? Do you have to? Um, I'll send it to you in the presentation if you need to see it. I don't know if I can slide it. Did you get to see it? Yeah, it's Commodore's back. He's worked today. Let me see if I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been told I'm you not supposed to wear a suit. Free code. <laughs> <laughs> but in honor of my father, I do at least once. <laughs> Um, I'm going to run out of battery later. So, when you're ready, if you would just introduce yourself to the audience, because we do have some people attending virtually. Okay. I will Let's see how far I can get here before I really need the slide. I have one on a thumb drive, if that would help. That's your yours. You oh, there, 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 right there. there it is. Popped up on my screen. It popped up on my screen too. Just gotta give David a moment. Looks like this. Yeah. But do you need to, you need to get it up for the audience? First? It's on the Zoom meeting. It's on. Is it? Is it? Okay. It's on the Zoom meeting. Yes. The people in the audience can't see it. The That's physical the physical audience. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. There, there, there it is. is. There it is. There it is. There it is. We got it all. Okay. Firefly Cove. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks. 
uh, I know the job you do. Uh, I've been there, done that several times, and it's by and large thankless, but I thank you because it really does help when you have good people that, that volunteer and, and make this all happen. Um, to your staff, Roy, Aaron, Eric, um, great people to work with. Roy, you know, he sends these emails and he gets mistakes and then I misinterpret it. But outside of that, <laughs> we're wrong. No, they're great. Aaron, they just, um, I can't say enough about them. And if who's, he said he would. Okay. So go to the, go to this next slide. You're running this. I'm running it? Yeah, you're running So did it switch to this now? Yeah. 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 It's on your screen. It's Ooh. on the big screens now. Okay. You're, you're in charge. So. You're in charge. Awesome. Um, just one clarification, I think. Uh, Tuscany Cove was the previous name. We're changing it to Firefly Cove. I know there's been some confusion, different places. Also, Travis Meadows LP was the owner. And um, in December of 2020, um, it, the ownership transferred to Firefly Ooh. Cove LLC. Um, my name is Dirk Gosta. Uh, one other thing is that, um, so relative to the property owner, I'm a, a member, a manager, and an owner of Firefly Cove LLC. So have the authority to be here today. Um, you'll also see the Sunrise Company logo and Sunrise Company. Um, I'm the president of the Southwest Mountain Region, or essentially I'm the president of everything but California, which I don't want. Um, and that's just a little bit about us. Sunrise Company has been around for 45 years, and it's it's kind of our operating company. So payroll, everything goes through there, and our entire history. Um, in that time, we've done over 16,000 homes, over 30 golf courses, country clubs, and retirement communities are our specialty. Um, fractional ownership condominiums, we did once in Aspen, just finished that project last year. We're different than most in that we're not just the developer, we're the home builder. And in the, in the communities that we have developed, in almost every one of those, we've developed 98% of the homes, built 98% of the homes. So we're A to Z, buy the dirt, lock the last door, sell everybody their house. Um, and that's the difference between Sunrise. We've done projects in Houston, Colorado Springs, Aspen, Vegas, and Palm Springs over the years. Mr. Foster? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I got a message from Mr. Street. He said, let him know when to change the slides because he's running it from. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, can so you can can he he see me? You could see yes, the slides he that he saw. He can see you. Okay. Team introductions. Great. Um, with me today, since everybody came, uh, Meg Moorhead is our salesperson and has been in the salesperson in a community like this before. Coming to join us uh, next to her is Michelle Connor, and Michelle is actually local. She lives in Jonestown, in Jonestown for 27 years. Mm -hmm. So I think she knows a few of you, and she certainly knows a lot of people in town. Michael Price, stay away from him. No, just <laughs> kidding. 29 years experience in Austin in all kinds of residential and commercial projects. Um, and he handles all of our construction operations. And I thank them for being here. They're here not because I requested it, because we put a lot of effort into this community. They've worked hard, and I think this is kind of a culmination. Uh, consultants online, Lacey Ellers with McLean and Howard. Uh, she's our legal counsel. Not that we need legal counsel, but we just don't know all the laws. And so she helps us out with process and what to do right, and what not to do. Um, Trey Gamble is behind me. Uh, he's with the Alliance Transportation Group. When we were before PNC, if there were questions, most of them related to traffic. And so what we tried to do is create a summary that he's gonna present near the end of this um, so that everybody kind of gets a good overview of just what we did traffic wise. Um, so Trey is here to handle that and has been doing that for years and years. Nick Sandlin is online and he's done all the civil engineering, all the planning that you see in front of you is, is done by Sandlin Services. Um, next, 
Can I just do that? Does that work for him? There you go. That's in use. He's he changing me. You can see up there. Okay. Um, I have to do mine though, because I have the little note. <laughs> I have the little note things below there. Got it. Um, Texas experience, because we're this company all over the place. Um, we did Royal Oaks Country Club in Houston, Texas. Yeah. It was 900 combs. It used to be Andra Airport. Yeah. Um, I love Texas when you can send a letter to the government and close an airport and put big white X's and that's it. You'd think it'd take forever to do that. Um, but 900 homes, they went from 300,000 to a million five. Uh, we sold lots for the highest price one was a million dollars. Um, all in the center of Houston, just south of Westheimer. A uh, very successful project. Mm -hmm. Next. This is a picture of the clubhouse at Royal Oaks. This will speed up quick. I was trying to give you a flavor of the things we've done. Um, and this bleeds into everything we're about. We're more about creating a community people want to live in than we probably are a house they want to live in. So we focus on how their life works in the community. We provide amenities like this. We had golf, fitness, tennis, you can name it. There's 40 different things you could do at Royal Oaks, all within the club. Uh, and that's kind of differentiates us from most people, uh, especially other builders. They want to build a house for you, sell you a house say goodbye. Um, that's not us. Next. One, one thing about us is that this is a production home. So this is a home that you could pick the floor plan in the sales office and build a house this size. Um, that's why we can go from 300 to a million five. Uh, we've gone from 3 million to 4 million in the desert. Um, and we do that with consistent architecture, consistent landscaping, not the same landscaping, just consistent quality of the landscaping. Uh, many of our communities, we incentivize the owner to do their, their own landscape, so it all looks different, <laughs> rather than going this, down the street, seeing the same tree, same place, same yard. Um, that's a lot about Sunrise. Just another picture of a house next. It was a model home. And now I'll go to Texas. Uh, I was previously with Brookfield. Brookfield's a I don't know, an $800 billion company or something like that. But I was president of Texas. We did a project called Kissing Tree, um, which the reason they engaged me was to create this. It's a retirement community in San Marcos. It is um, 1,300 acres, 3,200 homes, golf course, amenities that you wouldn't believe. If you're 65 or older, you can go down there all day long and find something to do between pickleball and bochi and golf and horseshoes and I could keep going on. Um, but again, we, we work with the lifestyle. Just a picture here, this is the entry that we did to Kissing Tree. The reason I brought this up is that you're on limestone, you're in the hill country, uh, the site was the same. We did vertical cuts on each side because the limestone was very hard. Um, just something to say, look, we've, we've been in this terrain, we know what we're doing. And that's Kissing Tree. Um, next, twice, go down to Easton Park. Another project I launched when I was with Brookfield here is Easton Park, which is down just southwest of the airport, bounded by 183 Slaughter and William Cannon. It is 2,200 acres, 16,000 homes. Um, it has launched been open for three years now, one of the best selling communities in Austin. Um, it's close in, it's, uh, I wanna say they're projecting next year, who knows what's really gonna happen, <laughs> but uh, to do 900 homes, which would be more than anybody's ever done in a year in the Austin area. Um, but a great project and good experience. A little different, this was the recreation center at Eastern Park. It exists today. Um, this is included in your dues. Uh, we built a lot of parks. Um, next, this is Bryant Park, just one of the parks. We'll end up with about 11. I say, will. some things you can't get away from. 
um, the, the community will end up with about 11 parks like this, which are all local, all bounded by houses, all inward where you can walk your dog, take your kid over to run for a bit, have a barbecue. We've got a covered space off to the right there, you can see. But again, we're more lifestyle focused. I did throw in one photo next um, of product that we launched there that was small alley load. Um, our first phase is designed like this, the 20 lots that had previously come before you. Um, we do a lot to mix up styles, colors, so that you're not looking down the street um, and going, okay, it looks like a barracks. Next, I think I've covered every bit of that except one thing. Um, one of the things that that we do different is we make changes to the houses. Um, you have a lot of lots here. People come, buy a lot, build a house. Our research over time, and we've done it often, is that 80% of the people of the home buyers don't have the ability or will not buy a lot and hire a contractor to build a house. So our niche is we go someplace between Pulte and the custom builder we make changes in our houses. Um, they're a step above, but they're not a custom home, but it at least allows, we get a lot of demand because people say, well, I can't afford to have a construction loan and a mortgage and build this house. They can with us because we build the house and then they close and then they move. Um, just a little bit about Sunrise. Uh, just a reminder, I don't know if it's a reminder, but. This is our amendment two. So there was the previous one in case that gets confused. Um, this slide Roy covered well about which is which are detailed, which are concept plans, and that we have to come back on the estate lots. Um, and then of course my topo, my uh, typo at the bottom was 3D instead of 2C or whatever I put. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, one thing quickly was, this is Tuscany Cove. And if you look at that, and then you go to the next one, which is our current concept plan, there's not a lot of difference. The open space, we have more open space, 15% um, more, other I wanna say 19 acres. And we have 325 versus 369. So it's less units, more open space, but we've also consolidated a lot of the, most of the, growth to the flatter areas uh, up along Boggy Ford and really worked with the topo rather than just saying, well, we'll just build houses all over here. Um, that's just the way we do business. If you'll go down, please, to the vision. One more, one more. Oops, one more. Just to Quickly, our vision is to create a holistic community that encompasses what it means to live in Lago Vista, Texas. We envision a place where residents proudly call home, a neighborhood where they choose to walk in the streets, to socialize with each other, front porch to front porch, on their bike, kids playing in the street. I grew up doing that. I'm sure some of you did. Um, but that's what we're looking for when we envision Firefly. It's a place where this is our community, this is our home. Neighbors want to know each other. Um, we design our houses with front porches. We design it so that hopefully they, we have walking trails. You'll see an amenity pass so you can walk from the mini neighborhood on the trail without getting into a car. That's our vision in summary. You guys can read, so I'm not going to go through it all. Just a little bit about it is log of it, three pictures. People pushing strollers, people want riding bikes. It happens all over here. We're not looking at doing anything different. We just want our community to be um, very similar and very safe, try to slow the cars down quite a bit um, so that they can feel comfortable walking. Uh, I don't know how many times I hear I got another one. Um, notice the next one. Next one. One more, one more, please. There you go. Uh, note the basketball hoop. This is Terrytown, where I used to live. Um, basketball hoop is in the street, very common. 
that's a goal. That's part of our vision is to create something like that. Go two slides down. Uh, how do we do that? We create covenants. There will be an HOA, the covenants that instill and protect this vision, uh, consolidate most of the residential uses, as I said, to the flatter areas, and then work with nature. And I think 15% more open space is not a bad deal. One of the things I think you probably saw in the in the amendment number one, we do a lot of things where we vary the setback house to house, changes up the street scene considerably. This is just, this is phase one, the 20 that you already approved. This is how we plot out the houses. Uh, we haven't yet, but this is how we do so that you're not sitting there just looking down the street going, there's two rows of houses. It makes a big difference. Um, architecture we end up give we end up having four different architectural styles in each for each house for each community uh, it's a lot of work to mix it all up we also then have three different architecture i'm sorry several different color palettes they can pick for each house changes the stone changes the color so this is just one of the houses we did that's the same house the next that's one of them we did next slide please same house, different colors, different stone, different architectural style on the right-hand side. Gotcha. We try to do that just to make it different. Next. This is the same house and the same style, just different colors. Next. This is the, this is the a different, same house again with a different architectural style and different colors. And I'm done with the houses. I've got two more slides to go. Um, amenities up in front. As you can kind of see in front of you, the, the red and the gray, um, all the residential goes up there. Down at the water, we have a 12 acre parcel and a four acre parcel, both of which are underwater. 90% of it's underwater at the, when the water's up high. Um, but we do plan putting amenities there in the places where we can pool, uh, shade structure, um, other kinds of, we may put some courts down there. Uh, we plan on putting a boat ramp, though it's not real conducive to go away, or it drops pretty quick um, once you get out of ways. Uh, but those amenities are amenities we'll put in. I put this slide up to note the trail system. Um, those trails actually exist. They're either a road in the property that's been used or they're trails that have been used. Um, this was actually off a of Google map where my son and the engineer rode their mountain bikes. So that's where the squiggly lines came from. But that's what we hope to do is that you can walk out of the back of your neighborhood. And if you want, you can push your child in the stroller and go all the way down the water. Um, there's just a closer, closer shot up of the, the acreage by the water and a representation of some of the amenities that we plan to put down there. <clears throat> Last slide from me, um, traffic calming methods that we'd like to implement inside the community. So it's not boggy forward, but <clears throat> narrower streets. I think you heard a month ago when you approved your transportation plan, uh, your consultant said narrow, narrower or safer. That's what it does for us. So if you squeeze things down and you don't make it conducive visually to speed through the neighborhood, uh, it tends to keep the cars down. Uh, we'd like a 20 mile an hour speed limit. That's what's in the PDD. Uh, parking on one side of the street. Uh, the main deterrent always is the residents. Now that's all proactive. We could just not do anything and be reactive, which means you'll have people come in here going, we want speed bumps because they drive too fast. Or you'll see a million of those green signs that say drive like your kids live here. We're trying to get away from that. We're trying to be a little proactive and say, we, we want this to be a place where people just go slowly um, down the streets. <clears throat> I would now ask uh, Trey to come up and just make some comments that we got. Uh, this just really comes from the planning commission and that we, we just felt that there was confusion in kind of what the traffic study was supposed to do and what it did and what was looked at. 
And so we ask him just to prepare, prepare a summary, and then you can ask him to be here to answer any questions you have, and I'll come back up if need be. Um, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Trey Gamble. I'm with Alliance Transportation Group. Uh, we prepared the traffic impact analysis, the traffic study for this development. Um, and essentially what we looked at, we were we looked at uh, the, the issues related to traffic related to the development. Uh, we looked at two existing intersections. We looked at the intersection of Boggy Ford and Lomans and Boggy Ford and Draper's Cove. And we looked at four potential access locations or driveways into the development. Um, in addition, we looked at site distance related to the driveway locations, the four driveway locations. Uh, the uh, next, next slide, please. The driveway locations, the three potential locations, Augie Ford, um, we went into the field and we took measurements based on, uh, it's, a, it's a visual, uh, the visual elements of, we, we stand at the driver where the driver would be sitting if they were turning out onto Boggy Ford. And we look to see what that site distance is down the road to a specific size target at a specific height. And then we measure those distances to determine if the site distance is adequate. If we, if we can see as far as we need to see to safely turn uh, onto the major roadway. Next slide, please. So for the first driveway, uh, if you look at this, the, the driveway location uh, in the uh, concept plan uh, is the dark uh, area. Um, the light blue area that you're seeing on Boggy Ford is where that driveway could be positioned and still have adequate sight distance in both directions. So as you can see from this, there's, there's room to work with with the location of that driveway access. Um, but this is where it's currently proposed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second driveway, driveway two, uh, is located near this curve. Uh, as you can see, there is no shaded blue area, which means that this is the location where that access would need to be. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, there's no way to move it one way or the other and still have adequate sight distance, but at this location, it does have adequate sight distance. Uh, next slide, please. Driveway three, again, um, as you can see, there's the, the shaded blue area, which is an indication of where that driveway could be located, where that access could be located. Uh, so again, there's some room there to be able to um, move it along Boggy Ford, uh, but currently uh, the location, it's about in the middle of that blue shaded area and has adequate sight distance uh, in both directions to function safely. Next slide, please. Uh, we also did sight distance to the access, for the access point onto Draper's Cove. Uh, we had to do this one a little bit differently than taking uh, measurements in the field because it is a, uh, there is a realignment associated with it. Next slide, please. So what we did with this one, uh, the the, the uh, graphic is showing the proposed realignment uh, that the driveway will uh, access will drive, uh, tie into, um, and we work from the uh, topography, the profile sheets in the civil design to be able to look at the site distances on that. So we took this was more of a uh, uh, calculated in in CAD uh, to be able to look at the profile sheet, to be able to look at the vertical and horizontal curves to identify that there is an adequate site distance triangle for this driveway location as well. Next slide, please. Uh, we did an operational analysis, as I said, of uh, Boggy Ford at Drapers and Boggy Ford at Lomans. Uh, counts were taken in 2020, um, and then we, um, we projected out uh, for two future condition scenarios. Uh, we projected out to 2024, to accommodate uh, the earlier phases in the development, and then to 2026 to look at the final full development. Um, when we do this, we look at the, first thing we do is we look at the existing intersection, uh, the operational analysis. Uh, we grade it just like, a, like you would in school, A through F. Um, typically, 
anything that's A through D is considered acceptable. E is not is, is typically considered uh, starting to be, get more heavily congested, um, and we try to avoid getting into E. Uh, we like to stay in D or better. Um, F is a situation where it's completely it's it's failing. It's not working well at all, and you really need to do something if at all possible when you get when you get those kind of conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So this. Uh, this one is the uh, uh, intersection of Boggy and Drapers. As you can see, the 2024, we look at a do-nothing scenario. So we grow, we take our existing counts, we grow the background traffic to project what traffic will be without the development. Um, and then we look at a do-nothing scenario. We analyze that traffic. Then we add the traffic for the development, and we look to see what the do-nothing scenario is for that. In other words, we grow the background traffic, we add the, the, the uh, development traffic to it, and we look to see what does it look like if we don't do anything at all? Does it still, does it still operate at an acceptable level? Um, so for 2024, uh, do nothing with, uh, without Firefly Cove and do nothing with Firefly Cove. The overall intersectional level of service is an A, uh, and the approaches northbound and southbound are a level of service C which is an acceptable level of service. For 2026, with the do-nothing scenario, um, the northbound traffic is a level of service C, southbound traffic is a level of service D. Um, with Firefly added, uh, the, additional, the additional traffic, um, the southbound drops into a, a level of service E. Um, the difference between uh, the different levels of service for the stop controlled approaches is in 10 second intervals. So what that means is when you get to uh, the difference between level of service D and level of service E, we're not talking about minutes of sitting there. You're talking about uh, potentially an extra 10 to, 10 to 12 seconds, 10 to 15 seconds between what you would see as level of service D and what you would see when you go into that level of service E situation. Um, again, the overall level of service for the intersection is an A. Next slide, please. The intersectional level of service for Boggy Ford at Loman, again, we looked at 2024 do nothing, uh, which is just the background traffic. Uh, and 2026, just the background traffic. Uh, for 2026, uh, without the site traffic on it, it's a level of service E. Uh, 2024, do nothing with Firefly added, it, it's a D. And then 2026 with do nothing and Firefly combined, it's a level of service F. So when we hit that level of service F, we look at uh, what can we do in terms of mitigation to make improvements. Uh, we, we propose putting in a left turn lane there, splitting that traffic apart so that the signal operates more efficiently. Um, and that gets us back up to a level of service B. Next slide, please. Uh, are, are there any questions about the traffic before Dirk comes back? Yes, sir. So basically, you have four entrances into the subdivision that you are no, no, sir. I'm sorry. I should have pointed that out. We had three potential locations on Boggy. Okay. Um, only one is going to be an entrance to the subdivision, and that's driveway one. Okay. Uh, one of the second locations and will be an be emergency rare. only. And that, but that, and, and then Draper's Cove will be a, a, a an access into the subdivision. So there'll be two access points into the subdivision mm -hmm. for the residents, mm -hmm. um, driveway one and, one and driveway four. Okay. And one other question, since he brought it up, Royal yes. Oaks, I'm familiar with Royal Oaks and West Armour. Is this going to be a gated community like Royal Oaks is? No, sir. It's real not. Familiar with it. Yeah, no. Um, doesn't seem to fit as well here. Okay. Uh, you know, just topo wise and like Royal Oaks, for example, you know, you're front on Rest yeah, Westheimer, well, Richmond West is going through the site, West Correct. Park. So, no, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for me or? I don't know how you do this. I just recognize them and then they ask the question of okay. whoever. So, um, Councillor Sullivan. 
my question, I think, was for you, Trey. Uh, you talked about the level of service at Boggy and yes. Loman uh, becoming an F with the addition of Firefly and Do Nothing. Uh, and then you talked about a, we do some mitigation, and then it gets to a B. Who's the we? Okay, so bottom line is it, it's the, the the development contributes to mitigate that. Okay, the, so the, the developer is contributing the funds to help the city make those modifications to that intersection. Yes. Okay. I believe that's agreement. Are you? Are, are it's it's <laughs> just to be just to be perfectly clear, the widening of Boggy Ford to create a left-hand turn lane going west to turn in to driveway one is 100% ours. Okay. Modifications to Loman Ford, um, Loman and Boggy is our percent and our percent is like 11% of, of what they, I wanna say it was 11% of like $600,000 of this stuff. It's a, it's, it's a participation, it's a contribution okay. um, for the amount of traffic that they are adding to that intersection uh, that's that's causing the uh, the additional impacts. But bottom line is within five years, we have to allocate the additional dollars, the 89% to take care of those other mitigating factors. It has to come from someplace. We've got several things. We've talked about a district of some type on ours or TERS. Um, we're open to doing more than just saying here's here's 11 percent and and the intersection's still messed up because it you know the funding's not there so i think there are ways we can work together to get it all done and, and, and listen I, I recognize that it's not going to be all you guys there's development that's happening down in point venture this in, in the county down that direction um development that's going to be happening in, in lago vista so i, I get it uh, that you guys just but i i just as a whole we have to be prepared to take care of all the mitigating factors so that that intersection doesn't become a, a real mess. Yes, we're just like the left hand turn. We don't, his study says we don't have to put that in until after phase two is done. Um, I can tell you we're going to put it in first. We're here to sell houses. Yeah. You know, last thing you want is customers going, look, I sat there, it was three deep, I couldn't get in. Right. Um, same thing with Loman. If it breaks down, we're going to be, I'm going to be sitting with Roy and Eric going, okay, how do we, how do we fix this? Right. We're a little different. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor? Yes. I think Aaron. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, just two kind of little quick inputs. The staff still working with Firefly on the TIA related items. So just be aware that that's one of the things. And um, I think the developer is properly, has appropriately represented, they will pay a portion they will be responsible for a percentage of the um, improvements that would be required at Loma Uh I think y'all are aware that there are other developments, for example, the gross, the gross plus track, the one that's at the corner of Loma and Boggy, um, actually comes to fruition. They will uh, be responsible for a portion as potentially any other um, entities that develop in that near area that add to um, the traffic flow. Um, but that's the one thing about this part of the application that's not 100% buttoned up. We're, we're finalizing those details. Gotcha. And if I might, Mayor, if I could follow up, you're saying that staff is still working with them on the TIA stuff. Does that need to be resolved as part of um, adopting this new uh, uh, adjustment to their PDD? So um, there is a there is some language in the PDD that uh, addresses that would make approval contingent upon addressing all the final comments of the TIA. Okay. If, uh, for example, between if you do not take action on the item tonight and consider it at uh, a future meeting and we work out those details between now and then, okay. obviously uh, staff will let you know that we finalized all the details and that that condition would no longer be required. Okay. If you look at page 75 under your alternative decisions number four is the approval incorporates by reference a satisfactory response to all pending tia comments so gotcha. if it was approved tonight it would it would contain that condition if we included it or as aaron stated if we brought it back at a different time it could be resolved by then there council prince Oh, did you have something to add to that, Mr. Jambor, please? 
case specific, we have three current attempted applications that will also contribute to the same intersection. Yeah. Literally. Right. So there are lots of parts. Other people who will create traffic and presumably yeah. contribute yeah. to the solution. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I have a couple of questions for Mr. Gosta. Um, so first, um, you referenced the uh, parks and open area. Uh, you also answered Mr. Williams' question about no gated. What, what, can you give us some commentary on non-Firefly residents access to the parks that are within the Firefly community? What's your What's your view there? What would the access uh, look like? Um, because there's an HOA, the the amenities we plan are for those people that live in Firefly. Mm -hmm. The only not the only, but an exception to that would be their existing residents. I'm sure you're familiar with down on the water, around 46 of those, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they have some rights to to use the beach, get to the water. So that'll that'll remain. Okay. We're not. I don't want to get in that battle, and it's worthless. Um, so they can still do what they want if they want to use some of the amenities that the residents pay to maintain. You know, we haven't talked about it with them, but there's certainly a way to get a smaller fee, and they and then they can use those resident those the other amenities that we have. Yeah, certainly, but uh, not outside I, of. I wouldn't have expected that for some of the you know let's call it the more advanced amenities. I'm thinking of in the the hollows area. There's quite a bit of trail area, and there's some open parking places, so people who don't live in the hollows can pull in there and ride their bike or walk around. Will there be any such thing in the Firefly trails that would be, you know, potentially accessible, or you'll act, you, the Firefly will actively do something to discourage a person from outside flyer, Firefly from parking and walking the trails, for example? Yeah, I want to say yes and no to all of it. But, uh, <laughs> Um, right now, it's planned that no, there won't be for the outside. Part of it is, is you know, you have a, a lot of facilities here in the Las, in the Lago Vista POA. We're not in that area. Yeah. And in contacting them, they said they're not interested in annexing any others. So some of this was by force, not by force, but some of some of this was done to give ourselves amenities because we can't. Our residents can't buy into that. Yeah, absolutely understand that. I just wanted to clarify okay. that because I've had other citizens ask. Uh, second question: um, Looking at the numbers again, uh, the the zoning um, SFA minimum size 1,100 square feet, uh, and it's it's close to R1D with variations. Is the mm -hmm. the way it's written up? Uh, one of the variations is 1,100 square feet, where R1D is 1,200. In your original 20 units, we discussed this some, and I remember asking you the question of what's the mix? Will they all be the minimum size? Um, we're looking at two, if I've got the numbers right, 280 units that are SFA. Uh, what in your mind does the mix of size look like across those 280 units? Would there be some some comment you could make about average size or they range from minimum to maximum? It's any commentary you can answer. Sure. Um, based on, Previous sales, sales data for the last, I've watched it now for three years, um, as just that goes in a Lago Vista. Um, the average, the average size until kind of this year, it's, I'm looking at the realtor because it's everything's different and everything's higher price. Mm -hmm. But when we when we first started, we were we were starting at 200,000 and going to 375, 400. Um, just move that whole thing up, 50 or 60 grand. I don't think those prices are going to stay there, but average size is 1,800. If you if you pull the estate lots into that, um, it's going to probably jump at another 300 square feet. But I want to our our house plans go from 1,100 to 3,300 square feet as a production house, and then we have additional houses that we can put on the, the in our pallet already that we can put on estate lots. And those go up to 6,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. We, I, I know it's, tr don't trust me because I hate it when people say that, but, you know, we're motivated by profit like everybody else. The bigger the house, the better we do. The, the more we make this neighborhood look great, the more we can push prices up for the same house. And we're looking for that buyer that wants to come in and say, I want the amenities. I want the trails and I'm willing to pay for it. I want better, a little better architecture. I want options in my house and, and we'll do that for them. 
it, 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 just to follow up on that, um, it, you said average size you would project might be 1,800 square feet. Uh, have you ever had a uh, PDD contract or would you be open to a contract where there was an average specified? Right now you have a minimum of 1,100. Uh, but if we say the average needed to be, I'll just pick a number, 1,500, uh, I, I think from a citizen perspective, that might pe pe make people feel a lot better and thinking because I, the, the fear is from some that I've heard is that there's going to be 280 units that are all 1,100 square feet. Right. Um, and so is that something that, you know, if council you know, wanted to put some, uh, you know, a note in there that you would be comfortable with? Perhaps you could say, perhaps you could say that, um, we could only do so many under 1500 or because mm -hmm. from 1500 to 2200 that's just the heart of the watermelon here yeah i mean and so i hesitate saying okay I've, now i've just got to build some bigger houses because i but if you had a certain percentage or a certain number 280 and you said okay only this many can be under 1500 i think i could that's pretty easy to do because you know we're wrong we're we want to build as as few of those as we can, yeah. not as many. And one more I step. I, 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 just, I don't want you to commit. I, I, you don't have to commit, yeah. but I mean, what what is a number for you? Is it 50 or 100 or half units that if they were that size, that you would be comfortable with? I'm trying to remember numbers in my head, which I'm usually pretty good at. Um, I mean, I think under 1,500 square feet, 17 18 percent is i mean i can look at i can go look at data and i can come back to you yeah. or we could we could dig deeper and, it, and to me it's based on data it's based on what you've sold here and what prices you sold and all i'm trying to do is match as much of the market as i can maximize our sales mm -hmm. and so you know the maximum isn't down at 1100 feet you know the the the, the the average rather you know it's it's in that 18 to i want to say now it's probably 2100 square feet right. since covid it's gone up so yeah. if anything i'm not hesitating because i think we're going to be bigger okay thank you this is made from the, from all the communities that i've seen of theirs there's no way they could do all the amenities that they were going to build the lower end house there's no way so <laughs> They, they, they're required to go for the bigger houses. They're not required to go for, uh, you're not looking at another brawn community where they, you know, people mm -hmm. are complaining in the neighborhood about yeah. houses being the same size or looking the same. They don't do that from every neighborhood that I've been in and theirs. One other comment too is, and I'm 65, um, you downsize? But it doesn't mean you want a cheaper house right. or not a fancy house. So we have plans that are two bedroom, 20 to 100 square feet. And they're a two bedroom with a den or an office. And they still want a fantastic kitchen. They want all of the stuff. And we do that. And that's the reason we do it is because, and I'm in that situation, right? You know, we're sitting there and my wife's going, no, we're, you, you need this. And I want that. I want my forever house. You've heard that often. And so we do that and we'd like to, and we do design a plan that's not, oh, it's 1800 square feet and four bedrooms. Now it's 2000 square feet and two bedrooms, two large bedrooms. I hope that helps. Yes, sir, that one. Yes, I have a question that's really a, a traffic related uh, question. Uh, my concern is with the condition of Draper's Cove. How much of Draper's Cove do you anticipate um, fixing because it's really in, in pretty terrible shape once you get down uh, part way to the water. That's actually a dirt question. Okay. Um, as you see, the the detailed plans only go about halfway down. Um, when you get further south, there's area on the map that's I can't remember SF A or is that what? Anyway, that's the the higher density, but down there we own. For example, we own Draper's Cove. We own the right of way, not the right of way, but we own that land that is Draper's Cove all the way down to the end, and then all the way into the middle of the lake. Um, 
you know, we don't really want to own it, but we're going to improve it. Here. We're going to improve it down to, you know, at least down to the, our amenities. And the, um, the amenities are going to be at the very end, at, right? At the, the very end. end. Well, the not at the end. It's very end of where then it turns and it weaves through all the houses. Right, right. And it gets over to close to Constitution Square, and that and that's where it ends. It goes to Mod Mod Raper. Right. And so there's there's that road to take care of. There are those homes we've been had we've had discussion. I had a two hour conversation today with with the gentleman that owns a house there and was involved in all of Lago Vista. He's a lawyer. Um, and he was there they're trying to say, okay, you know, is there a way we can get our road? fixed? Is there, can we get a better water system? And I've had conversations with Roy and Aaron about, look, with what we do, if we can fix some of that, um, now's the time to do it because we're bringing infrastructure down and it's a lot easier. So there's just a lot of considerations. And then if you kind of look at it, you'll go, if you look at the plan, you're just like, well, there's, we, we own all the colored stuff, but, but all those white spots in there, are other individual properties, none of which are in the city. And as you probably know, you can't force them to annex because mm -hmm. um, of a new law. That's right. all I know. Right. So, I mean, you got to work with them and say, okay, here's, you know, and some of them are just a lot, we surround it. And it's just a lot more work than we were willing to put in today, given that that's phase three. So I don't know if that helps, but, you know, it's kind of, well, we, We'll work with Eric and Roy and we'll come up with a solution that works. We need to get second access down there. There's no second access to all those houses. And I think we can do that. We've identified some places. And so that's kind of our attitude. The other question I would have for you is how, what, what is the time frame that you have in mind for fully developing the, the residential area? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that our business plan is we're done in five years. Five years. Okay. Um, hopefully four, but you know, I'm I'm hesitating not because of anything we're doing, except I think there's going to be a slowdown here. Mm -hmm. Government's spending a lot of money, and uh, so I'm you know I'm just not sure it's going to run out the way it's if if it was like the last year, we'll be done in a year. <laughs> If you if you fully uh, develop that area in four years, do you anticipate staying in the area and continuing to um, build other communities, possibly another one in, in Lago Vista? Is that in your in your? Ha have not thought of it. No, um, I know most of the properties here. There are some opportunities I think to pick up some of those that were foreclosed on and been sitting around. I've certainly driven through. I don't want to name names, but Many of the communities down there thinking, okay, there's some opportunity here where there's infrastructure in place. Outside of that, outside of those, there's not really that I can think of 300 acres that I know of that's just, oh, here you can buy this and start new. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but you, you would know better than I would. <laughs> okay. Thank but you very I, I mean, in all sincerity, I love Lago Vista. So I'm, we, a, I'm from Nebraska and I like the North Shore. That's good. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one of our council members that's virtual. I need to make sure. Shalane, do you have any questions? And she's still with us. Okay. I can't really tell. We may have lost her. See her. She was caller seven, but mm -hmm. I don't see caller seven. No. Mayor, if we don't need the presentation, um, someone online has suggested that if we could close that, it'd be easier to see the. Um, Did anybody need the presentation please? still? No. All right, Dave, you can close the presentation. Thank you. All right. This is a public hearing. Uh, is there anybody in the audience? I did not have anybody sign up to speak on this one, but is there anybody who would like to uh, address council?
All right, I am not seeing any hands. I see caller 11 and that wouldn't be Shalane, would it? Hi, yes, it's me, Mayor. All right, questions. Do you have any questions? Comments? I'm sorry, Mayor. I had to sign off for a, to take care of some family business, and I, I would say go just go ahead and move on to the next item. I'm not sure where we are. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was just we're at the point. I was just everybody up here at the dais had spoke. I was just wondering if you had had any questions or comments, but if you weren't able to uh, follow the presentation, then. No. I was not, but thank you. All right. So is there any direction about uh, second hearing on this? In council? I was going to ask you if we could, is it possible to make a motion to close this out? Oh, I was trying to get a little feel because uh, if we're going to take any action, I would need to close the public hearing. Yeah, that's hearing. what I'm asking. So, yeah. I'm just... I did open it at 6:54 or something yeah. like that. I did. I did my open it. She did open it. I don't know exactly. I think it was 6:54, but um, but I did open it. All right. Well, then I will go ahead and close the public hearing portion at 7:48 p.m. All right, and I will bring it back to council at this time and I'll entertain. Very good. Yes, Councilor Sullivan. Mayor, I would make a motion that we approve this application and the conditions that were set forth in the ordinance that was drafted by staff. Uh, and one last uh, council is that um, it would be inclusive of the changes that I had requested Mr. Jambor earlier in the week. There were three topographical changes that he made that we, that's the one that we're going to approve. Oh, okay. She did. Second. All right. I have the motion and a second. Any further discussion? I, I have a suggested amendment uh, around this uh, maximum number of homes uh, under the 1500 square foot level. Uh, and based on that conversation, I, I kind of raised your number a little bit to 20, if it was 25% of the 280 uh, under, that would be 70 units maximum that are under 1500 square feet. I see Mr. Gaza is comfortable with that. So I would suggest that as an amendment to the conditions. I have no problem with that amendment. Then I'll second your amendment. <laughs> Who was the original second? That was, I was. He has to Oh, be, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know. Stay out of my business. <laughs> I'm second. <it. laughs> you agree with you agree with the amendment as well? Yes. All right. So I have got to overrule. All right. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All, right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, All those opposed, nay. Hearing none, the motion carries unanimous. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. David Vogel. Oh, okay. Have to get the laser. He's been asked. Well, tell him hello back. All right. All right. And we are now on number seven. And if y'all are leaving us tonight, you know, be careful. Watch for the deer. I know y'all know they're out here. And we appreciate your attendance. Thank you. All right, number seven. The Lago Vista City Council is holding a public hearing considering ordinance of the City Council of Lago Vista, Texas, amending the official zoning map by changing the zoning district of approximately 2.183 acres of land that is not platted, but located within the boundaries of Lago Vista Travis Plaza a subdivision of record in book 39, page 50 of the Platte records of Travis County, Texas, 
and generally described as being located at 20806 Bonanza Street from P2 Parking Rebelt District Passive to R4 Multifamily Residential District and providing for related matters. The Lago Vista City Council remanded this application back to PNZ at their meeting on July 15th, 2021 for specific findings in accordance with section 13.20D of chapter 14 of the Lago Vista Code of Ordinances. It was placed on the next available meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission, which was held on August 12th, 2021. The item was introduced by the city attorney. Six of the seven members were present for the discussion. Another member was absent from this portion of the agenda because of internet connection issues. Five of those six members approved a motion finding that the application met all three specific requirements of section 13.20D of chapter 14, specifically including the finding that significant and unanticipated changes have occurred in the area of the affected parcel since the classification on the land use map was adopted. Uh, impact if approved, the property would now will now be located in the R4 zoning district. If denied, the city of Lago Vista will continue to own the property and it will remain in the P2 zoning district. Uh, I will open the public hearing at 7.53 p.m. And does staff have anything to add to this summary? All right. Do we have anybody with the applicant here that would like to address council? Do we know if we have any of them in attendance? Where the applicant? That is crew, I forget. <laughs> Uh, so here's what I have to add. Um, no, never mind. Uh, I get to reading and you know, I forget. <laughs> All right, so questions, comments from council of ourselves. Mayor, I would just suggest that we table this item and allow staff to do some additional work. Okay. I would second that. Um, well, this is a public hearing. Uh, I do have several people that have signed up to speak on this. So before we go into actual motions. Uh, Notice I just said, I suggest. Okay. I didn't make a motion. I just suggested that we do that. Yeah, well, good, good. So before we get to your suggestion, um, let me get my thing out. Does anybody have any questions, comments at all? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it has been my practice on any issue that comes before this council to try to contact a fairly good sized group of our citizens. And I have a, a group of a little more than 50 that I call on a fairly regular basis just to get their feel. And in most situations, I will get maybe 34, 20 against, or maybe the other way. Um, this is the first thing that has come up where I've gone to these people and asked them what they thought. And I only had one person out of the whole bunch that thought that it was okay. And I don't think he really understood what was going on. So this is, uh, this is something that I think our community as a whole is not very happy with. Um, I think it's something that needs to be looked at in more detail and we need to see if there's a way to figure out how to get out of this, back down the road on this to, uh, to do something that uh, doesn't end up putting the city in a uh, legal situation. Okay. Uh, well, I just wanted to, I'll make a note here just, you know, just so every, everybody in the audience knows, uh, council knows, because 
we've been told, but um, the park or the piece of property uh, is zone P2, park and greenbelt district passive. Uh, the way it's zoned, nothing can be really put on that piece of property. No structures. Uh, you can have some benches, uh, maybe a water fountain if there's water running to it. Uh, and it says some children's playground equipment. So um, this is not something, you know, that zone P2 is going to be, you know, made into a really nice park. It was, it's just going to be a piece of land with maybe a bench and a water fountain. Um, but I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware what the current P2 zoning of this meant for this piece of property. Um, anybody else? Mayor, I'll just uh, add my comment here. Agree with Mr. Weatherly wholeheartedly. Uh, in uh, you know, there, there certainly are some questions that we need staff to answer for us. Uh, some legal uh, issues that uh, we were able to discuss a bit in the executive session, um, and so um, I'm, I'm with uh, I'm also in favor of us, you know, following citizen commentary here. Uh, uh, not making a decision tonight, but uh, coming back with uh, with those additional answers. All right, Sh Shalane, I think I saw your name pop up. Caller eleven, did you have something to? Yes, Mayor. Um, I was actually just going to put in my um, my vote of, a, of agreement with what has already um, been stated, and then just to add to that that. We could have uh, some walking trails there, though, right? We can't have structures, so we could have benches, perhaps a fountain, and some some trails. Is that right? I would assume yes. It didn't say anything about trails, but it says no structures, so I wouldn't consider a trail to be a structure. Okay. They then I would uh, an elevated pathway through the trees or something. Okay. Then I would just. Um, agree with as i mentioned what's what had already been stated thank you all right well if that's all the council then i will bring in our citizens i have a few that have signed up uh first off is uh diane jean jupin you are recognized hi mary mayor thank you and thank you council i have a prepared that I'd like to, uh, that I was read, I would, would read just to add my voice to uh, many of the discussions that have happened with regard to this topic. As I recall, when this item previously appeared before the council and also with the subsequent remand back to the PNZ committee for two PNZ agendas, an oft brought up reason to justify approval of this zoning change uh, post a conditional sale of property to private interest was in essence, and I paraphrase, that we members of the PR, uh, Parks and Recreation Action Committee had plenty of time to express our disapproval or non-agreement many times in the past. This was specifically repeated a number of times in, in the last PNZ meeting, seemingly as further justification for its approval going into today's council meeting. Aside from the fact that this rationale in and of itself, to the best of my knowledge, is not a valid reason for zoning changes, for it is inherent in the process that there are multiple uh, avenues throughout a process to present new information, positions, and groundswells of interest as something works its way through the system. However, since it was presented as a reason, in response, I would posit and reiterate here additionally, regardless of whether those statements are factual or subjective conjecture, that um, going back to a woulda, coulda, shoulda as a circular argument in a different time, a different focus when the city's Sunset Park was a main priority and when there was no director or manager of the Parks and Recreation Department and with, different group, and with a different group of people is not a valid basis for this rezoning. The original basis, as I understand it, was that this property zoned as a P2, a passive park and greenbelt district, was deemed by one individual as unsuitable for park and recreation use, uses, and was arguably perhaps justification for the sale. Now, since this proposed zoning change has come before us multi in multiple venues, there have been many involved and concerned individuals, including members of the PRAC, 
our Parks and Recreation Director, and members of the immediate community, community who have attested with words and photographs to the park usability and feasibility of this property, usable as a variety of both passive and or active, should they come to four, and green belt modalities. Additionally, we have expressed passionate desires to participate in expanding upon and achieving such goals. Our PRC, PRAC is currently preparing a POA for uh, potentialities, including funding contributions, and plans to put specific goals for this property in our 2021-22 plans. And yes, even if it is passive, I believe there are many, many passive potentials without building a structure on this property. It's a beautiful piece of property and very, very usable. And I sure hope we have our council support for the community in keeping it a green belt and park for park usability. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, next I have uh, Miss Christina Lucero. Ms. Lucero, you are recognized. Thank you, Mayor. And I am in full agreement with the other council members who have voted to seek more answers and to uh, put this on the hold on, on the table. Um, we have no city parks that are actually city parks. Uh, everything is POA. So if somebody is not a member of the POA um, in one of the, the outside areas or in a renter, um, they have to either go to stand at the park at Veterans Park, which is on the corner by City Hall, which is not much of a park, um, or load up the family in the car and go to Sunset Park. While most of the citizens live around the city center, not necessarily out by Sunset Park. Um, but we do, in the city center, have a ton of duplexes already. Um, and a ton of duplexes that every time they have an occupant turnover, people who leave in the middle of the night leave a bunch of bulk trash, furniture, mattresses, filth sitting at the street side or outside of their garages for months sometimes where you guys cannot come by and pick it up because your hands are tied. Um, the street cleaners can't either because it's not out at the street side. So it's citizens have to go over and move their stuff out to the street side or it sits and we all sit there and watch it. People have to walk around it. And this is one thing that is a big problem here and that we still have not solved this problem. So I think that bringing in more multifamily uh, landlords who live out of town who are just renting these places is not the best idea. What we should do is we should keep this beautiful land as a green usable space that's convenient and people can actually use it that live around it. Um, families, people who are coming from the elementary school or from the library or have a lunch break around City Hall can walk it. They can walk the trail system there and they can use a little shady tree with a little park bench. We don't need any structures or anything like that. Um, but I believe that we should keep Lago Vista beautiful. And I think that especially that little, that little town center would be a great place for that. Um, I won't even bring up about the city dump that was proposed to be in that same little area, which I'm so glad it's not anymore, but I believe that that area should be for green space, trails, community coming together to hang out and have a nice little shady place to sit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next one. Uh, all right. So the next card I have is from Miss Lori Dick. Is she in attendance? All right. Uh, she asked that I read this one on her behalf. Um, Okay, so Ms. Lori Dick says these, the zoning change should not be approved for several reasons. The executive summary is misleading, stating that the PNZ found significant and unanticipated changes have occurred in the area of the affected parcel since the classification on the land use map was adopted. 
but no one from the city can articulate what those changes are. The proposed zoning change clearly does not meet the criteria set forth in Chapter 14, Section 3.20, DE 1, 2, and 3 of our ordinances, a fact which was discussed and ignored both at City Council and at PNZ. PNZ is clearly under the impression that the city wants this push through and they approved it despite objections from one of their members that they were ignoring chapter 14 criteria. The contract list the buyers course in construction and or assign, which means the buyer has the right to assign his interest in the contract prior to closing. This is often done when a buyer intends to assign the contract for a profit before closing, AKA flipping it once the zoning change is approved. The contract is clearly contingent upon the zoning change, no matter how you want to spin it. Why is this buyer being given preferential treatment by the city? It should be noted that this buyer is the same contractor being awarded a multi-year, two plus million dollar contract for taps and line extensions under agenda item number nine of this agenda. On the future land use map, this property is designated POA, an error which is misleading to citizens and the Parks and Rec Committee members looking for property to use for trails, pocket parks, dog parks, parks, et cetera. Parks and Rec Committee was not given an opportunity to review and present plans for property prior to marketing. They state that they could and would use this parcel as much needed green space, trails, dog park, et cetera, for the citizens of Lago Vista. It would be easy to get volunteers to cut simple trails. Any land zoned for parks should not be rezoned or sold until a thorough documented review is completed by our Parks and Rec Committee. Why bother having these committees if you don't intend to consult with or listen to them? Please do not approve this zoning change. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lori Dick. Uh, the next one is from Darcy DeVoe. Uh, is Ms. Ms. DeVoe with us tonight? All right. Yes, Mayor. Mayor, can you hear me? Yes. Do you want Mayor, to can you hear me? Yes. Do you want to? Uh, make I would just rather you read. Sorry, I would just rather you read it. I'm on a flight, so it's hard to talk. Okay, I got it. Okay, from Miss DeVoe. This is Hello, Ed, Tracy, and Sandra. Okay, let me skip down to the actual number seven part. Number seven, thank you, Mayor, for reading this out loud for me during citizen comment time. I would like to ask all of you to decide against PNZ decision. I attended the last meeting and I believe PRAC did show we could use it as a trail or dog park with little effort. PRAC has had several meetings trying to find more open land. Somehow this was never afforded to us this 2021 year, nor can anyone past remember it being offered as passive parkland greenbelt by anyone from the city. This property should have never been grouped in the land the city was trying to get rid of in 2020. We have all seen the destruction of green space throughout Lago Vista, and I hope we can save some space for the next generation. I also live off Don Drive and object to more R4 in this area. Once the elementary school grows, the congestion will be awful. I ask you as your neighbor, please do not grant this zoning change. All right, thank you, Mr. Vogt. All right, I have one more and I have to go to my email because it prints off like that. So let me go here. Let's go down here. Go this way. I guess. All right. Let's see if I can get this up. All right, this is from uh, Ms. Letha Guy. Uh, respectfully to the Lago Vista Mayor and City Council, I am unable to attend tonight's council meeting, but wish to have my comments regarding agenda item number seven read aloud for the record. Attached herewith is my citizen participation registration form. As you know, there is a pending 
zoning request to rezone property at 20806 Bonanza Street from P2 to R4. I have visited said property and find it to be a quite beautiful slice of green space. There's no evidence that this property was in fact offered to other parties to develop as a park and as such passed on it. The city has hired a parks and rec director who has met with the PRAC regarding this property's potential to become some type of recreational green space. We have an excellent PRAC who is led by and comprised of citizens who want to develop beautiful parks and create recreational opportunities for citizens. They are excited at the prospect of doing this with this property. I request the council leave this property as P2 giving time and further thought to how this green space can be developed as such. Also, I do not believe it meets the findings of fact that PNZ was charged to do. It also seems odd a future city vendor has entered into a contingency contract to purchase this property condition upon it being rezoned. Thank you for the opportunity to address you on this issue. Sign Letha Guy. Thank you, Ms. Guy. All right. Uh, that is all that I have that have signed up on number seven. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak who did not sign up with my lot of card? Yes, please uh, address the audience, state your name so everybody knows. Sorry, short. Hi, my name is Sarah Teal. I apologize that the front portion is a little bit redundant. We hadn't talked about the land being passive, so that's part of my comment, um, but I'll just read it how it is, so you don't have to redo it. While reading through the city ordinances, I happened upon a couple of things that seem relevant to this rezoning issue that I would like to bring forward for consideration. The definition of P2, which Bonanza is currently zoned as in the code of ordinances is identified as P2, Park and Greenbelt District Passive, no structure shall be permitted except for benches, water fountains, and children's playground equipment. This land was always zoned to be passive, not heavily developed. In fact, P2 is actually the only park zoning designation out of four different types that is passive. If it could be called another zoning name, it might be called nature zoning, since it leaves the most natural elements behind of all the park zoning districts. I know that one of the arguments for rezoning was that this parcel could not be developed as a park because of its topography, but that seems to be a moot point since it has always been zoned for very minimal development, if any. In reality, it appears the land is already being used in its current designation as, pa as a passive parkland parcel. I have heard citizens in previous meetings that described residents walking their dogs on it which is exactly the type of thing that is seemingly meant to happen in a P2 zoning designation, according to the ordinance description. Also with the passive zoning, it seems that merely having nature and green space on the parcel would fulfill its zoned usage as a passive green belt. In prior meetings, I have also heard the explanation that all the extra land was zoned to P2 for ease and to decrease tax burden when the land use map was created. I couldn't find anything formal in the record detailing this, but if we are to assume that all P2 land isn't really P2 land, but rather an inexpensive placeholder, then how is it possible to determine what passive parkland or green space is actually meant to be protected from commercial development? Again, from the city ordinances, the often talked about 13.20D states in, that in order for a rezone to occur, it must be true that Significant and unanticipated changes have occurred in the area of the affected parcel since the classification on the land use map was adopted. It is unlikely that the parcel will be developed or used for any use permitted under the zoning classification indicated in the city's master plan. That the requested zoning classification is the most appropriate classification for the area affected. If the mere existence of this parcel as a green belt fulfills this parcel's passive zoned usage, and the citizens of Laga Vista are already using the parcel for things like nature walks and dog walking, then stating that it is unlikely to be used as permitted or that it is not an appropriate zoning classification as P2 seems a bit off the mark from my perspective. I hope Laga Vista can find a good balance between encouraging development and protecting green space. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, is anybody else who would like to address council? Mayor, I'm online. Can I uh, address, please? Uh, Rod Courtson. Yes, sir. All right. I appreciate it. I'm Rod Quartz and I'm the guy that's uh, <laughs> that has the contract here on the property. I just wanted to state a couple of things. We're not uh, uh, looking to do anything with the property I built the, right across the street. Actually, I live across the street. I live in the neighborhood uh, and we do walk in the neighborhood as well. And uh, it is a beautiful piece of property and uh, we think good things can be done with it, uh, including a park. Uh, you know, those things are all fine. Uh, where this thing started back in 2020, the listing came up, the city was putting it up for sale. We saw it pop up on MLS, our real estate uh, agent brought it to us. It had that it would, could be rezoned. And so that's why we uh, went under contract to purchase it. And or signs is, is uh, someone had mentioned, it's basically for us to put it into a development. We would build on it ourselves. We're not flippers and that's just not, not how we're, we're, you know, we're doing things. Uh, we built the property over there across from uh, on Boggy, on Portsmouth and Boggy, across from the new apartments. We built the townhomes there and duplexes, and that's similar to what style that we would be, be built there. Uh, so anyway, it's uh, just wanted to kind of clear up, you know, our, our position. Uh, we're, we want to do what's best for the city, regardless of what you, you know, what you choose to do there is best for the city. We're, we're fine with those things. We're not trying to we don't want to be a part of anything that's uh, that's hurtful to the city. I live here. I'm a part of the city. Uh, we came here because I love Lago Vista and I am a builder and developer and that's just what I do. But uh, anyway, uh, we're here and I thank you for uh, the time uh, to listen to, to those things. But I'm behind and support the city council of whatever you guys choose to do. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience? All right, well at this time, I'm gonna bring it back one more time, council, questions, comments? If not, I'll leave the public hearing open and we'll move on to the next one. Cool. All right. And we are on number eight. We're into action items. Discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding resolution number 21-1897, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Lago Vista, Texas, canceling the regular City Council meeting scheduled for October 7th, 2021. I did not print out the heat. Um, just but so the audience will know, uh, the Texas Municipal League has, oh, here we go. Each year, the Texas Municipal League hosts a conference for elected officials and staff to attend in the state of Texas. This conference allows attendees to participate in learning sessions beneficial for changing dynamics in municipal government and networking with other municipal representatives and exposure to vendors with products specific to municipal government. This year's TML conference will take place in Houston, Texas, Beginning on October 6th and concluding on October 8th, 2021, the consideration to council to cancel the regular council meeting scheduled for October 7th, 2021 is due to a lack of council and staff to attend the meeting based on those attending the TML conference. So we're gonna go educate ourselves. Uh, we didn't get that opportunity last year uh, and we have some new members, so. It's a great opportunity. Um, questions, comments, council? I, I would just say it makes sense to me. And if there's some agenda items that we believe can't wait until the October 21st meeting, I would presume we can do a special called meeting to address this. If need be. All right. Is there, is everyone attending? I'm going. Well, he signed up. Mm -hmm. Mayor, uh, Mayor, for personal reasons, I'm not able to attend. Okay. Oh. Well, we will make sure we bring you back a whole bag full of goodies and information. Thank you, Mayor, and I hope to attend next year. All right. All right. Anybody from the audience have any comments on canceling the meeting? 
I know you're disappointed you won't be able to see us. But, uh, all right, I'll bring it back to council. And I'll consider a motion. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we cancel the October 7th, 2021 council meeting. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Hearing none, October 7th meeting has been canceled. Unanimous. All right, number nine, discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding the TAPS and line extension construction contract award and authorize the city manager to execute the contract. Okay, the Lago Vista City Council is, oh, that's the wrong one. I got it right here. Thought I did. You need it, sir? No, Tracy's got it. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> I know I've got it. There it, it is. Looks like it. See, I knew I had it. Okay. The city re recently received five bids from contractors willing to perform line extensions and service taps for the city. The bids were turned in by 11 a.m. on August 3rd, 2021. The city currently has a contract with CTX Civil Constructors signed in 2018. That contract has not exceeded three years. The auditors previously recommended a new revised bid be issued. Staff has reviewed and tabulated five bids. A summary of the bid tab is attached. The review of the tabulated cost indicates Cordson Construction as the lowest bid. In addition, Cortson was the only one that provided a valid bid bond. Neither Lance Plumbing or CTX Civil Constructors provided bid bonds. The bid documents were set up such that the contractor was provided a rough, a rough estimate of how many taps and possible extensions were anticipated in the coming years. The city receives tap and line extension fees from builders. The fees are set up to cover the expenses incurred by installing new taps and pipe extensions. Courts and construction has demonstrated through the bid process that they are experienced and overall qualified to work with the city on utility infrastructure expansion. Staff recommends awarding of a unit price three-year contract to Courts and construction as the primary contractor. After three years, both parties have the option to extend the contract for an additional year up to five years. City staff may request council award a separate contract for a secondary contractor should the workload exceed the capability of the primary contractor. If approved, the approval will, be, will begin the contractual paperwork process for this project. Once city staff has completed the paperwork, the mayor or city manager will sign and staff will arrange for the project to start construction. This will allow the city to get caught up on line extensions and taps and for the utility staff to concentrate on maintenance and replacements. Contractor will be required to provide the city with insurance and payment and performance bonds. If denied, the city will fall behind on taps, line extension requests, Currently, currently, there's approximately a two month backlog. Staff is not able to keep up with demand unless a contractor is assisting. Uh, I just wanted to note the funding source. City collects fees for the taps and line extensions. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments from council? I'm happy to see more than one bid. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad to see a bid from someone that is local. Uh, I, I think there's also, uh, it's been pointed out to me that there's a typo in the contract that has our ex city manager's name in there. Uh, needs to be caught before we uh, uh, go through with that. But otherwise, this looks good to me. Yep. Yeah. And I think it it says that if we approve this, then staff's going to work on the paperwork. Exactly. So that I'm assuming that'd be part of the 
working on the paperwork to fix their name. Anybody else? Shalane, you have any comments? I do not, Mayor. Thank you. All right. I do not have anybody from the audience that has signed up to speak on this one. Joe Joe Penn is waiting at you. Yeah, yeah Joe Joe Penn. Yeah. All right, Miss Jean Joe Penn, I see your hand. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor um, Sean Yu Pin, just in case anybody. Uh, Mayor, I apologize ahead of time if I totally blanked out, but on item number seven, did did we need a motion or action with regard to that? No, ma'am. It was a oh, uh, okay. and the public hearing is still open and will be carried to the next meeting. Gotcha. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if that is, is there anybody else in the audience on number nine? All right, well, if that is everybody, I'll bring it back to council for uh, possible action. Um, Mayor, I will make a motion uh, that we award a uh, unit price three year contract to courts and construction as a primary contractor, and that we authorize either yourself or the city manager to sign that contract once it's been completed properly Second. by staff. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. Hearing none, the motion carries unanimous. And we are on number 10. Okay, just Discussion, consideration, and possible action regarding a complaint alleging ethics policy violations by the Charter Review Committee Chairman Robert Durbin. Uh, as stated earlier, uh, we consulted with our, our attorney on this. No actions uh, were taken coming out of executive sessions. No actions will be taken at this time. Um, the next step. Uh, will be uh, a preliminary hearing and notices will be provided regarding the preliminary hearing. Questions, comments from council? All right. I do have a few people who have signed up on some comments here. Uh, let's see. First up, I have Miss Christina Lucero. Miss Lucero, are you still with us? Yes, there she is. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, sorry, but this one got me a little enraged, um, and I have to tell you why. Um, I was appointed to the Charter Review Committee and proudly served with Judge Durbin and all the others in the group. It was a wonderful group. Um, he was a wonderful chairperson, and I was grateful for the experience to serve the city. I'm enraged because this was not brought to light. Uh, no complaint was filed back in April when we first started this committee and when all of the information that we were trying to gather um, began. And uh, we, were we were tasked with the job of reviewing the charter and speaking to council members and department heads for their insights and their ideas of changes and additions. Um, this complaint was not filed back then and I believe that it was being filed now because he applied to run for city council. Um, I, I know this too because I got a letter when I filed to run for city council saying that I had a conflict of interest as well. And um, I fought the allegations and they were dropped and I ran and I lost by 40 votes. It was a great experience. I think more people should try it. Um, I was not going to let anybody scare me into not being able to run for city council and serve this beautiful city. And that is exactly what they're doing to Judge Durbin. And he is going to be a great council person. His knowledge of this town after living here for decades 
his service in this town on various boards, commissions, and as the associate judge, all volunteer, none paid, and his knowledge of law and municipalities. So in our charter, in section 1114, it states under the charter review, I'll just read the part that I bolded, the committee shall inquire into the operations of the city government as related to the charter and review the charter to determine if amendments should be recommended. Judge Durbin was only doing his job as the chairperson of the charter review committee by inquiring into the operations of the city government. This claim is yet another example of election interference that they have done time and time again. I ask you all to consider throwing out this, this fraudulent claim and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great evening. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's see here. And the next one that I have is from Ms. DeVoe. I will be reading that on her behalf. I think she's still in the air. She may be on the ground. Uh, she's headed for Alaska. Uh, number 10. Uh, I have known Rob Durbin since he ran in 2020 for city council. I have found him to be honest in every sense of that word. He has helped me understand some of the agenda items and given me advice whenever I have asked him. I would just like to ask why would he want to give power to the BOA if we all knew he was running again for a city council seat? We all know if you are on city council, you cannot hold a seat or chair on any city committee. Also, at what time did this charge occur and why would you wait till now to bring up these accusations? Is this to make election interference and soil Rob's good name to the public? Thank you, Darcy DeVo DeVoe. All right, thank you, Ms. DeVoe. And that is all that I have that has signed up to speak on number 10. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to address council? I'd like to bring up a point of order, if that's all right. All right. Yeah. Sure. I also would like to complain about this lectern as being the most worthless lectern on earth. Um, I want to call your attention to uh, and I won't go into any of the defenses or anything at this particular time or the accusations. I'd like to bring your attention to section 1.1809F2, which states uh, um, complaint file, filed by an individual member of the city council shall be deemed to have been filed by, in the council member's capacity as a private citizen and in such event, the member of the city council filing the complaint shall not thereafter participate in a city council meeting or discuss the same with the city manager, if applicable, at, uh, at which the complaint is considered, save and accept the council member filing the complaint may participate as a complainant in such meeting, which I believe means uh, if you're going to follow the, the uh, procedures which you all have set out that any time that this is before the city council, that neither you nor Councilman Davila can sit as a council member and must present your case as a regular citizen or in your terms, civilian. Um, uh, so I don't believe you are, you can be behind the, on the dais and I believe you need to present your case places from here. It's again, that's 1.1809. Two, and I understand since we are going to go forward with a, uh, uh, a hearing in this uh, executive session regarding whether or not the complaint states anything uh, of value, then uh, I'll, I will uh, reserve any further comment from that time. But I also believe at that time you would not be able to participate in executive session other than as a complainant, not as a council member, pursuant to your own rules. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, is there anybody else in the audience who would like to address council? All right, seeing none, I will bring it back to council. Um, Mayor, Look. did we need to make a motion to table this item for, uh, and then, so I will make a motion that we table this item for now <clears throat> and that the staff work with council and um, uh, Mr. Durbin to schedule a preliminary hearing. A second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Hearing none, the motion carries unanimous. And that is all that I have on the agenda. So I will call this meeting adjourned at 8.37 p.m. Thank you, thank you. And you can stop. We